let's go. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis, and I'm one of the developers of the Fundamentals Library. In today's presentation, I'd like to discuss the power of Angular elements and how it can benefit cross-framework development and also how we can achieve the best results with it. So, what is Angular Elements? It's actually a library that allows developers to wrap their Angular components into a standalone web component. Uh, thus, you use it in uh, different applications uh, powered by React, Vue, or even vanilla JavaScript. Thus, reducing the time needed to support multiple platforms. It also supports the self-contained Shadow DOM, uh, which also affects in a good way the performance of the components. And also in conjunction with module federation, it gives more optimized bundle size of the overall library. And it's also easy to use for the developers who, are, who aren't familiar with uh, Angular. Seems pretty promising, right? Well, there's a couple of issues with that. So the first one is that the Angular elements requires a pretty complex ng module. Uh, this is because of the ng modules injector, which is passed to <coughs> sorry, uh, which is passed to the component itself, so that it could get the information of the declared components, directives, uh, services, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and also from the parent imports, parent modules, parent imports. Uh, yeah, and the components are actually bound to that module injector. So how we can actually get rid of these uh, complex ng modules and simplify the code itself and also simplify the usage of the Angular elements? Uh, here is the question. How we can actually, uh, first of all, communicate with the parents? So uh, as you know, um, Component are receiving the injector from its uh, module, yeah, which contains the information about the declared components from this module and also from the imported modules into a particular module which we are bootstrapping. But there is another way. So if you take a look into the API of the custom elements, uh, you will see that it also supports passing them custom class, custom factory class in which we can actually do almost anything with the component and also with the element of the web component. So why not actually expose the module injector to the element and actually inherit it for the child, uh, child web components? So the scheme looks like this. Uh, for example, we have the current web component. On top of it, uh, we have some HTML element like div or section or main or whatever. And on top of that, we're also having some component. So instead of using just the injector that provided by the module, we actually can ask the parent component if it can provide us more information, more interesting information like the services, like global services, um, other injectors, uh, other injection tokens, and the components itself. So here is the small code, uh, the small snippet of the code. So here we can see that uh, when we actually created the element, uh, we are asking the parent element if it uh, also contains the injector. So bear in mind, we have the two types of injectors. Uh, one is the module injector. And the second one is the FD injector, which is node injector, which is actually a component injector. So it's two different types. And we then ask the parent if it can actually uh, provide us more information. If it does, uh, then we update the current injector parent with the new, um, with the parent parent uh, injector, thus receiving even more information regarding the uh, declared components, uh, services, um, providers, uh, etc. And after we updated our current injector, we actually initialize component with the uh, new updated injector. So that was pretty clear at this uh, moment. Now, a more interesting thing, communicating with the children. So Angular can uh, provides a couple of ways of actually getting the child elements from uh, the component. So there is the view child and view children, which are natively supported even in the Angular elements because the elements are part of the component template. 
but uh, with the content child and the content children, it's a totally different story. So they are not supported by the Angular elements due to the rendering engine uh, specifics. But how we can actually resolve this? Um, so before that, a uh, couple of benefits of the uh, syntax of the content child and content children. We can actually pass the query selectors, uh, even the class uh, name, and we also, and it also supports the injection tokens, so that we can uh, embrace the full power of the DI, so the dependency injection. For example, when uh, two components are inherited inherits the same interface, for example, yeah, and provides the same token. Thus, uh, it can use multiple uh, components which are inherited by the same interface, but still implement a, different, a bit different logic. And here is the web component way. <laughs> so they mostly rely on the query selector uh, to get the element. Of course, they can use some attributes, not just the uh, tag selectors. But again, it's not that powerful as Angular Way. The benefits of that, it, yeah, it works. <laughs> like nothing more, unfortunately. So how we can actually leverage uh, both approaches? Well, I have the answer for that. Uh, before that, let's dig into the technicalities. So what we need to firstly have is that we need to react on the DOM change. For example, when the new element has been added, when the old element has been removed, or when it has been changed, because again, uh, the different information flow is uh, always changing. And we also need to support uh, injection tokens, class names, and the query selectors. So how we can achieve that? First of all, reacting on the inner DOM changes. This can be uh, done with the help of the mutation observer, which actually listens to the any change in the inner DOM of our component, uh, which is collecting the new data and passing it to the query list. So here is the small code uh, where we actually initialize our mutation uh, observer inside our component DOM. So here you can see that we are passing the config. Again, the config can be uh, even more strict or a bit more flexible. For example, we don't need to listen to the attributes or something else or for the comments, for example, or text. And then we just observe it and we call our notify function, which is a bit more complex, but let's uh, dig into it later. So uh, the second question is how we can actually check uh, if the element actually fits the conditions. Well, for the simple selectors, it can be, of course, done with the query selector all. So we are just passing the CSS selector to the method, and it returns us all the elements that are suffice the condition. With the class names and uh, tokens, it's a bit more complex. So what we need to do is actually we need to ask the elements injector, which we exposed previously, whether or not this injector can, uh, can return us some value. If it does, then uh, this element actually also uh, fits the condition, so we add it to the query list. So here is the, again, the small uh, code snippet. So here is the case where we have just a string. So we are uh, taking care of it like usual selector. Then we have the more complex case with the class name and the injector. Again, bear in mind that with the query selector and the wildcard, it's it's not that performance performance uh, breaker uh, because of the shadow DOM. So you might ask, what if we have a thousand lines of code in one component? Well, that's that component. The component should be pretty easy to read and pretty easy to actually render, on my opinion, again. Uh, and since we have the shadow DOM, it will not traverse into the inner components to search for it. Thus, it also mimics the uh, logic of uh, standard uh, content children decorator. So by the end, we have uh, such result. We don't need to actually uh, do some heavy refactoring of our code in our libraries or applications. We just need to place a new decorator on top of the content children, and it will work. 
it will work the same way as it works with the content you want. So uh, now uh, let's go to the more in interesting part is the automatic uh, web component generation. As I talked to you previously that uh, the NG modules of the Angular elements are pretty complex because they need to include uh, multiple information. We need to have the ng do bootstrap where we actually bootstrap in our modules. We need to apply some selectors to it, uh, pass the injectors, uh, pass the custom classes, yada, yada. Um, there's a bit more optimized way to do it. Uh, Semi-automatic, I would say. So what we need to support? So we actually need to have some backwards capabilities so that the module would work in both Angular environment and in uh, web component environment. We also need to have some agnostic approach so we do not rely on some component specific uh, cases. And we it would be good to have some automated generator. So here is uh, a new uh, decorator, which we place on top of the Angular's component. And we just pass the selector there. Uh, this will serve as a flag for the ng module to actually treat this uh, component as a web component and create its factory uh, when it's needed, when the module is uh, bootstrapped. Yeah, so here we store the web component metadata of the selector and we use it on top of the Angular component. And Inside the ng module where we have our component declaration, we have our declarations array. Again, this is done mostly because of the um, true shaking of the Angular. So it actually removes all the metadata from the ng module decorator. Um, there is a way to do it more advanced uh, with the help of custom builder, but I will not dig into that. That's a uh, topic for another con uh, conference. Uh, so let's uh, keep it in mind that this is all happening mostly in the build time and runtime. So uh, you can see here that in ng bootstrap, we're actually going through all of our declarations and we're trying to generate the web component. And here, uh, what we're checking is that the component itself has the web component selector. And if it does, then we pass in the injector and our custom made uh, factory class which does all of that magic with uh, hierarchical uh, injectors. And we are actually creating the custom element if it's not yet been um, yet created. So yeah, that's pretty much it for the automatic uh, creation of the web component. Now let's go to the web components in the application, how we can use it. So there is actually two ways on how we can consume Angular elements uh, in third-party application, I'd say, yeah, for React, Vue, or VanillaJS. Uh, first one is, to, is the easiest one, is to build elements as a standalone application and simply load it JS. The second one is to build elements as a library and include Angular compiler to the application, or use uh, ng tools module uh, for the webpack, which uh, actually removes the need of uh, including Angular components, and it also supports the ahead of time compilation, and it also works uh, nicely with the tree shaking. So, what are the benefits of the application approach? So, first of all, there is no need to load any external compilers. You just load your JS code, and it works right away. It's also easy to include into your existing applications. You don't need to refactor your code, add new modules to your builder or anything else. Just load the JS and it works. And with module federation, it actually can give some benefits if the library of components is actually pretty big. So it can share uh, the third party libraries across all of those components, thus reducing the size of each individual component dramatically. But what are the downfalls of that? So the resulting bundle of the JS code itself does not include any metadata. It doesn't include any typings. It doesn't, doesn't include any interfaces, um, anything else that can be exported. It's just a plain compiled JavaScript. And if you look into the uh, Angular compiled JavaScript, it's uh, pretty unreadable JavaScript. 
the second downfall is that due to unknown usage uh, scenarios, the resultant bundle can actually be a pretty large one because Angular doesn't know uh, which part of the component is actually being used during the build. Uh, now uh, let's compare it with the library approach. The benefits. Uh, we are actually exposing component metadata, interfaces, uh, typings that we have, and it also supports the tree shaking if we include the ng tools module uh, for the web app. But the downfall is that the Angular compiler is required. Again, this Angular compiler is included into the ng tools. So if you don't use that, you need to import the library. If you use that, you don't need to do that. And the second one is that your application needs to be a bit refactored to support uh, this ng tools uh, module. So uh, with that said, I'd like to show you a small demo. So let's firstly show you a bit of the code. Here I have, uh, I hope you see my screen with the IDE. Any other, can you please? All good? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, great. So um, here we actually have uh, two applications. One is the Webpack driven, which is includes uh, this ng tools uh, module, I'd say. So it's the Angular Webpack plugin. And the second one is actually the static way. So we have the index.html with some uh, compiled Angular. Again, it's not yet production compiled, but anyway, it works as it should. Uh, so let's first check the uh, Webpack way. So here I have the TypeScript. Here I have my themes definition just to make the themes of the tab uh, more interesting and modern and dark. Uh, and what I actually do is that I simply bootstrap in the tabs module. And that's it. I'm doing nothing more. Inside it, inside the HTML, you can see that I'm using the FDW tab list. Here I have the FDW tab uh, with a title, uh, with a button inside it, and couple of more buttons. So this results in such a way. Um, you can actually check uh, our library and see how we use the content children here. So you can see that the title from the tab is actually passed to the uh, tab section um, here. So that it, it actually knows the children, which we have. And it actually works as a usual Angular component. So everything is supported in the keyboard navigation. I can also show you some responsiveness of it. So if we do it a bit more, okay, not do it more. Okay. Zoom in, yeah. Uh, so you can see that we also have some overflow working. So everything that you expect from Angular component to work, it also works with the uh, component. And what's interesting is that uh, here I have uh, some events. So let me quickly show you also the code. Here I'm actually grabbing the FDW tab and I'm simply adding the native uh, event listener. So instead of using the um, event emitters, yeah, we're just using the add event listener for the opened event, which is uh, Angular native event, event emitter. And we simply console login that the tab has been opened. And you can see here that when I click on the new tab, uh, the value is locked here. And what's more interesting is that here we have the button, which is a completely different module. Uh, here it's the button web component module. So it's uh, separate uh, from the tabs module. Yet, uh, let's assume that we need somehow to receive uh, some value from the tabs, from the button. Uh, inside the button, we need to receive some value from the tabs. So let me quickly click here to receive its injector. And we can actually store the object. And now if we do this, you can see that we are getting the tab inject variable, which is a part of the tab module providers. And you can see that it's actually returning some value. Same applies to the factory, this value is existing. So all of this is actually working. And the second one is the, yeah, again, um, this is also supply, uh, supports the alpha completion. So here we have the item. And if we actually type the item, 
And click here, we can actually see that we have some items here that we have, for example, area label. Yep. So item dot area label, and we can assign something to, to here, something here. And for the uh, static application, I need to run the MPX for that. So this is this is a more simplified version of this application, uh, but still uh, shows that it can work. Okay, let's make it work. Sorry for you guys. Yeah. So here is the static version, and you can see that it is also working. It doesn't include top, but still serves the same purpose. And it also, and it actually uses the shadow DOM inside it, so the uh, query selector is uh, pretty much optimized for that matter. So yeah, here we have just a bunch of standalone components uh, from the standalone modules, which can actually work as a standalone, but still complex application. So thank you for your attention. That's all from my side. If you have some questions, I'd like to answer them.